such that you get that there. Uh, today's session is divided into two sections. First part, of course, will be a presentation and talk by Professor Dr. Mathai. And for the second part, we will have a panel discussion. Along with Professor Bondabhatta for the panel discussion, we have two very eminent architects, uh, personalities from the field of architecture. Uh, Dr. Ben T. Wolf, University of Copenhagen, Director of Projects for Sirampur Initiatives. And of course, Professor Roger Thrai, Professor of Architecture, Guru Govind in the Prasad University. And our very own Professor Manoj Chakraborty, who is the Director of School of Architecture and Planning at SNU, and also a conservation architect himself, will enter the panel discussion. I can imagine this will be a very engrossing and interesting session, kindly do drop in your questions. We would love to hear from you, we have to hear your suggestions, your questions, your queries, everything. I'm sure the speakers will love to answer them. Uh, without further ado, over to Professor Chakraborty, sir. Yeah, without uh, delaying any further, thank you very much, Andrila. Um, I would like to, um, uh, before asking uh, Professor Bandhupadhyay to start, I would request, um, I would request, uh, um, I would, I would say a few words about the two panelists that we have particularly chosen for this. Um, is Roger Thrai, Professor Roger Thrai, who's, who's a senior in our profession. Uh, he's now uh, uh, a professor of architecture at Guru Gobind uh, Indraprastha University in Delhi. And Rajutta, as we fondly call him, he's a, he's, I, I, I call him, he's a, he's a teacher by birth, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and Rajutta is there with us. He has got extensive uh, uh, research being done uh, in, 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 on Hooghly in much earlier days when Hooghly was not talked about uh, in terms of heritage, per se. Um, so I remember he made a fantastic report um, for the EU uh, long, long ago. And therefore, I felt that Rajinder will be very appropriate to be a panelist in this session, along with Chominda, who knows each other very well because they studied together in, in, in the same Bengal Engineering College, which was earlier called BE College, um, um, and uh, now it's called by a different name, IIEST, uh, which has got much more centralized with a lot more infrastructure. But I think I think the pioneering research work done in those days were much more. Coordinate. And secondly, we have got Ben Wolf, who has been involved in this stretch of Cal uh, of the river, uh, particularly with Sarampur. Bente is a is an anthropologist, and uh, and he came. She came uh, to be uh, to initiate a project um, in Sarampur, which is also on the river bank, um, and uh, uh, she headed an initiative called Sarampur Initiative, which is an initiative of restoration, community involvement, planning, etc. Particularly with respect to Sarampur, and a couple of uh, quite a number of projects were actually restored, um, where I was also involved as a conservation architect in them. And, and uh, 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 she has been here coming and going and meeting various sets of people regarded re in relation to her work. And, and, and I think she knows uh, the, the, the landscape uh, in her own perspective, in her own way from a distance, which is always a better um, a perspective, I always say, because when you are into a procession, you don't know how big is the procession. And Bente had the advantage of looking it from the rooftop. So she always saw a much more, I'm sure, um, with regard to this heritage landscape, which is, uh, which is uh, a Hooghly heritage uh, with a lot of settlements all along the river. And uh, she is back with her, uh, her final uh, uh, stages of work uh, of Sarampur Initiative, which has become very, very successful and talked about across the globe, not only in the context of Calcutta and Bengal. And uh, so she will be very appropriate, I felt, uh, to be part of this uh, discourse and discussions. And uh, before I ask uh, Professor uh, Bondupadda, I have just one request that let us have a very brief one, one 69 slides 
from Professor Bandhubadhyay. So we can devolve a lot of time in our discussions, both from the panelists as well as from the participants, which are quite, uh, quite not very uh, big in number, but quite qualitative participants, I would say. And, uh, and therefore, uh, therefore, let's begin with, with Professor Bandhubadhyay. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manish. Thank you. And thank you, uh, obviously, to Rajata and Bente for, uh, you know, uh, being here and uh, all, everyone else. It is um, a great pleasure again to talk to uh, the Sissan Nivedita University. It is, um, again, um, uh, an opportunity to talk about our work. And uh, it is very important that we um, share and engage in understanding uh, different perspectives as far as uh, any of the architecture of the creative arts and the planning and urban design goes. Uh, I've just loosely um, titled this one as Looking Beyond Conservation, Managing Heritage and Adaptive Reuse. Um, the part of that is to do with my experience in uh, from the recently concluded the uh, Hooghly um, Heritage Project and the other one is uh, my long ongoing uh, association with research. I think it'll be good to probably, yeah, thank you. Um, so one is to do with uh, my work in Hooghly and the other one is my longstanding relationship with and the work we have been doing in Oman, both research and implementation work. Uh, mainly I'm focusing on um, uh, the domestic heritage, which is what I think is, uh, you know, my concern in this particular case. I'm not talking about the special buildings. Nevertheless, I'll probably make reference to various uh, special buildings as well. Uh, but on the other hand, it is important that we consider this issue of managing heritage and uh, the proposition of adaptive reuse within the domestic uh, architecture context. Um, I will, uh, what I'll talk about, probably many of you would, uh, those who are initiated in the heritage uh, areas and conservation areas would obviously know. There are many issues which are contentious, but also ongoing debate uh, is there and there are certain acceptances as well. So um, if I just go start with, you know, we work in a team, uh, whatever work research we do, we work in a team and that's called Archeam, which is architecture and cultural heritage in India, Arabia and Maghreb. Um, that kind of sums up the geographical extent of what we do. Uh, we have a team which we work with, you know, we, as you know, Jamila is already here in the, in this group, um, uh, Mary Shepperson, who is an archaeologist, we have architectural uh, and research assistants, we have uh, various other anthropologists and other uh, uh, members, either as core members of the team or otherwise drawn in, and we do undertake work uh, in different parts of the world. Um, mainly, uh, these are the kind of areas which I think uh, Andrila has already indicated. In India, of course, uh, the Hooghly River region is something that we've been working with, with this AHRC project. And down south uh, in Mysore, uh, next to Mysore in Shrangapatana, we have been working on understanding what we can do with waste management and uh, also with uh, uh, sort of tourism trails and how we can enhance those through uh, enhanced knowledge exchange and so on. Um, the core of the work has been in Oman where we work on uh, historical work on various sites. Uh, we've been documenting, but also proposing uh, a number of uh, management plans and so on. And uh, digital heritage is also important. And in Qatar, we have been doing this uh, major um, digital heritage uh, project with Qatar National mm -hmm. Library. The idea is to bring together everyone and all the material that exists on Gulf uh, architecture and urbanism uh, in that context. And also finally Morocco, where we are working in an oasis called Mahamid, which is very close to the uh, to the to the border, uh, you know, the Saharan uh, sort of just north of the Saharan edge, and it's close to that's an oasis which is part of the kind of Trans-Saharan um, uh, uh, route, the trade route, where that existed and still is important in many ways. As I was saying that, you know, I do, we do a number of these heritage management plans. We've done that since nine, in 2009 uh, with the Ministry of Heritage and Culture, with the Ministry of Tourism, various other ministries in Oman. Uh, Oman has been a major part of our work uh, for a long time, uh, for kind of almost 
now about, I would say, 25 years plus uh, on there. And you can see that these produce different kinds of reports about how we can actually make the manage management of heritage useful and relevant to contemporary generations. Uh, just I'll start with one thing that is that, you know, uh, everyone probably knows by now that Liverpool's what they've, uh, UNESCO has voted to take Liverpool out of the World Heritage Site uh, list. And uh, it is, it is uh, obviously, uh, you know, saddening, but on the other hand, it also brings up a number of issues that I think uh, both parties are uh, responsible for. And I think if you, uh, there is a really very good book by one called Lynn Miskell at, uh, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think she's at uh, Illinois. And she has written a, a book called uh, um, uh, Heritage in Ruins. And that's a kind of criticism of uh, the approach that UNESCO has taken right through various major projects. And I think it is a kind of relevant context within which uh, all the discussion should be had. Um, that, so I feel that you know, conservation versus management of historic sites has been a major tussle in here. Um, sorry, I think I'll probably have to switch up my... Um, uh, anyway, uh, so uh, conservation so Professor Bandhapadha, if I may interrupt, uh, the slides, we are not seeing the slides in full scale mode. Are you not? No, not. So, oh, uh, yes, sorry. we are just seeing the, uh, yes. Um, can we thought, have the, yes, in large yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I stop and share then? Sorry about that. Just give me one second. Uh, Can you see anything on my screen at this moment? Can you see? Yes, uh, but you need to um, give it a slide. Will, you want? Yes. Can I? Can you see the first slide there? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. yes. And if I go to this, right. can you see the full slide? Yes. No, yes. yes. Absolutely. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know. You should have told me before. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through this. Um, so really, uh, conservation research management of heritage sites, I think has been very important uh, in this debate. And I think the, the fact that, uh, you know, conservation was sort of seen and the cultural landscape was never really understood fully in the context of a dynamic city like uh, Liverpool is uh, really, really important to note here because much of the problems arise from not understanding the cultural landscape as the key determinant of uh, understanding what to manage and what heritage to manage. And I think the research, the multidisciplinary work has been undertaken in Liverpool quite a lot because of um, the extensive work uh, that has been done on slavery to uh, maritime aspects of the trade and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think that's quite an important part of what I should be talking about. Uh, role of planning in urban ar architectural design, I think is very important. We should not think that conservation and heritage management aspects is devoid of the issues surrounding planning and urban and architectural design because they're central to whatever we do. Because at the end of the day, every environment, because of the changing population, demographics, culture, society, and so on, will have to actually change. And therefore, the notion of design the, in the broadest possible way is critical to all of this. And uh, I think it's very important that we understand that in this context. And well, of course, the final thing and the foremost matter I would say is a stakeholder engagement and the whole politics of stakeholder engagement. And this becomes very important in the domestic context where I think there are multiple owners and so on, where the politics of uh, stakeholder engagement is crucial. So um, I'll just uh, highlight this one, but I'm not going to talk about it. This is the kind of normal process for the World Heritage Site. And I'm posing the question that whether the Hooghly River region can ever be a sort of World Heritage Site. I think there are potential for it being uh, becoming a World Heritage Site. But for that, I think we need to, uh, first and foremost, understand it as an entity and therefore as a cultural landscape rather than as monuments, as specific and uh, disaggregated monuments. So you know, we, we have to, the basic outline is that you know, we carry out relevant research and background research. I think it is, in, in our case, in the context of Hugli, it is very limited uh, and it is disjointed. Uh, I think developing comparable analysis is absent, uh, preparing the draft statements and so on, outstanding universal values. I would come to that one because I think that the local values actually underpin outstanding universal values a lot more 
than we often think. And then defining the re relevant attributes and so on, obviously going to establishing authenticity, integrity, defining appropriate boundaries, you know, that is, you know, both the boundary of the sites, but also the boundary, the buffer zone and so on, and uh, preparing descriptions and then preparing, you know, the kind of uh, compilation and so on. Now, this uh, Hoogly uh, uh, heritage uh, management uh, strategy that we brought out in uh, a couple of years back was part of the one of the outputs of the Arts and Humanities Research Council project, which was led by Dr. Ian Magarera from uh, Cultural Studies. Uh, well, she, he's from French originally, uh, but and has done some quite quite a lot of work on uh, the French presence in India. And uh, we had a really big team, but the whole point was to bring together a strategy which would be developed and further uh, a new edition will come out in a couple of years time, I'm hoping, uh, which will have updated uh, discussions and assessments of the situation. Uh, but that was mainly to do with uh, really posing a strategy for the wider uh, region rather than the individual entities. But And not forgetting that obviously Manish has talked about uh, Rajat, uh, Rajat Das, Professor Rajat Ray's uh, pioneering work in, in this area in the early 90s, if I'm not mistaken, or late 80s, when the first early intact, one of the early intact proposals on the Hooghly River region was prepared by uh, Rajat Ray and uh, others. And uh, also there is uh, the, the Danish and the Dutch uh, uh, work, and the Danish work has come to really good fruition with Bente's uh, involvement and the kind of the, the Danish government's involvement, uh, the National Museum in, of Denmark's in, involvement in there. So there is quite a lot of work within which we are putting this this particular thing. And this is just a representation of where, um, you know, on our website, if you go on our website, you'll find more details of both the RKM works, but also uh, of work that uh, has been done uh, on this particular work. As I was saying that Ian was re leading the project there were various other um, contributors to it, and we had uh, a huge uh, group uh, based in, in Chandanagar and in uh, the Hooghly River region, mainly based out of Chandanagar, really, uh, because we felt that that was uh, really a helpful base from where we can tackle the work. Um, and uh, as a result of that, and this is a slightly different work from uh, normal research projects, because what we call today in the UK as impact work, there's a lot of this is actually happening as impact work. That is that what changes we can make and bring to the location, to the locality. So uh, one of the key things that is that we have now established our intact chapter, the Hooghly chapter, which is uh, and is holding regular uh, lecture sessions, a series and so on, especially leading up to the Christmas. There were quite a number of uh, excellent lectures done. And uh, also there are a number of other outreach projects happening uh, really to uh, empower the stakeholder, owner stakeholders uh, in this whole process and to understand how we might be able to help in different dimensions and different ways. But that is ongoing work. But uh, as you can see, there's a large number of uh, this group are really about uh, what we have been able to uh, bring together in Chandanagar and in the Hooghly region itself. So, uh, the, so the main work is impactful work, uh, but at the same time in the management strategy, what we are trying to do is to understand that and put that in the context of existing work. And we are looking to the Hoogly Corridor and how much of that should we consider or not. Uh, there are particular case studies that we are looking into both in terms of the domestic nature of architecture, but also in terms of the work that has already been done within the Hooghly River region, especially the work in Sirampur, uh, uh, looking at the work that has un been uh, undertaken in Barakpur. There are potential new projects happening in Konnagor, which is a kind of more politicized local government in initiative. Uh, and we are hoping to engage with all of these. Uh, and then we are also looking into um, kind of more critically understanding these and whether we can learn from those and sort of put it back into the wider strategy. Uh, this is an evolving doc document. So clearly this is something uh, that was presented a year back in its sort of initial state. And we hope to bring that forward in the next uh, you know, couple of years. So the important intentions were to uh, focus on sustainable preservation and uh, you know, on, in the context of continued habitation. So it's the dynamic context within which we are looking into heritage. It's not a preservation project. 
you know, uh, collaboration of local inhabitants, as I was saying before, is critical. And we are looking to sustainability, not just as an ecological or a cultural project, but also looking into the financial viability of these things. And that's something that underpins a lot of our work in Oman. Uh, then there is this issue of social inclusivity and the spatial flexibility of uh, the projects and, and the way that we should look into heritage and the importance of the voluntary sector is something crucial to us. Uh, we have also uh, obviously looking at continued research so that we can build up this work. So one of our mem team members, for example, is looking into the contribution that uh, independence movement and especially the uh, Shantanashwadi uh, movements, you know, the terrorist movements of the sort of early 20th century, how they actually had uh, important heritage impact on, on Chandanagar. We're uh, essentially trying to understand uh, whether we can contribute uh, as you know, through this as a roadmap to the state, uh, the local state and the union authorities, how, how we can influence them and how we can shape those. So, but that's a longer term plan. But all this is put in a critical, within a critical understanding of the UNESCO and the ECOMOS guidelines. We are not necessarily saying that that is uh, sacrosanct, but they have to be looked into in the context of if we have to make sense of heritage and if heritage has to have any, um, you know, uh, future, then I think that, you know, we need to think about it in a much more dynamic context. So a few things that I want to pick up today, uh, and that's to, and before then I will go into the second half, a little bit on the work of uh, our Omani uh, work that I've done. Uh, so I would like to uh, underpin these sort of these themes as I go through this uh, talk. So one is that the values and valorization of cultural heritage. So local and regional heritage values, uh, as I think that are important to enhance uh, outstanding universal values. And uh, unless that is uh, how it's understood, it will not actually create uh, a really sustainable and uh, resilient uh, outstanding universal value and could be kind of influenced by other forces rather than coming from the ground as it were. Uh, the importance of research, I say, and I highlight here the importance of morphology, imp importance of cultural landscape formation. I'm also uh, trying to understand this within a multidisciplinary work, and that's what we do. Uh, heritage and community, very important for us. Uh, and then the issue of living heritage rather than the kind of just the display and the presentation of heritage, which you know, can become a museumified world. And that's something that we certainly want to move away from in our context and certainly very important for the domestic architecture. And then in terms of the reinterpretation and the engagement, what we want to propose is obviously, in, and this is where I draw in examples in these last two cases of uh, on uh, the work from Oman, uh, where we are talking about the inclusive heritage, about interpretation and engagement of the local, local population. I'll give examples from Oman. And also in terms of the adaptive reuse approach that we want to approach, uh, uh, adopt, uh, and I think that it is critical in the case of, in the context of uh, domestic architecture, that both this, uh, the stakeholder engagement uh, through possibly um, uh, kind of cooperative type of collaborative uh, sharing uh, approaches because of the multiple problems of ownership. And uh, the other one is to do with the continuing change and the need to make changes to our domestic environments. And that is where the adaptive reuse element comes in. So this again is put in the context of, you know, the Chandra, for example, if I draw on, I'll draw mostly on Chandanagar uh, examples. And uh, there was a really good, uh, excellent pieces of work done by Tipnis, uh, a Tipnis architects, uh, who did uh, an extensive survey of uh, Chandanagar houses, uh, mainly domestic houses. And there is a kind of uh, initial classification that has been posed, uh, which includes such things like French houses, French townhouses, French garden house, in the French townhouse and in the French Rajbari, uh, or kind of regal houses, if you like. Now, while this is a kind of useful beginning, but I think that, you know, when we are talking about research, when we're talking about uh, really meaningful research that can lead to management of heritage, I think oversimplifications can become quite problematic. So while this is really fantastic work, and I would say that, you know, some of the work that was done by Tiffany's uh, architects with, uh, you know, sort of classification of sort of doors and windows and so on and so forth are absolutely very vital, but it needs to be taken to that next step where we understand the relevance of those 
elements and iconography is used and where they come from. So I would say that, you know, things like one particular uh, program that, you know, we should all watch is the BBC's, um, you know, Neil McGregor, who was the, sorry, the, the this is a British Museum uh, BBC pro program of uh, the w history of the world in uh, 100 objects, you know, where every object Neil McGregor takes and sort of looks into it in terms of the range of connections that it establishes. I think it's very important that we understand this sort of multidisciplinary, multi-layered connection that exists and bring that into it. So the research has to be more in depth. And this I speak mostly in the context of a very hybrid uh, expression. And again, everyone of us who are probably there uh, assembled is, will know that you know, it is an incredibly complex uh, architectural expression. So you've got columns which are not necessarily just a very faithful expression of um, a Western uh, Corinthian column or a, a, a Ionic column or, a, you know, or a Doric column. There are kind of incredible varieties of that, but also at the same time, there are a number of arch forms and so on, which are coming from a range of directions. Let's not forget that we have just finished as these uh, places grow up, we just finished a strong Islamic influence, a period of strong, very strong influ Islamic influence. So therefore, you know, those things are persisting. There are innate uh, other Hindu and Buddhist cultural influences that are coming, uh, there are there, as well as the kind of more innate sort of, uh, you know, local cultural influences that have always been present. So you get this incredibly hybrid kind of uh, 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 constructions like this temple on the right hand side, where you have uh, essentially a kind of colonnade, a colonial colonnade, if you like, set with uh, Islamic arch and possibly uh, with, and also Hindu motives on top with the temple. So it's a temple, but it is paraded as something else as well. So those kind of uh, buildings actually need a lot more work and need a lot more thought in terms of how to conserve, restore, manage heritage and so on. So another expression is here in, the, in this, uh, during the work we picked up was this uh, uh, a house where these really beautiful um, cast iron um, uh, balustrades, you know, the railing elements are there. And you see that, you know, a normal one on the right hand side, uh, uh, these are uh, the kind of ones that evolve with a uh, link between sort of Indianized for versions of an European Form. But on the left hand side, what you see is also a, a insertion of Radha and Krishna, you know, into it. The fact being that, you know, this particular house had a small shrine dedicated to Radha and Krishna. And there are visitors who actually come into this building to uh, pay homage to uh, pray and pray to, in this shrine. But so the context of that one um, uh, is taken over by the building. And the building actually creates these brilliant um, you know, re representations, which are neither just Western, neither just uh, Indian, or even a mixture of that. And it goes much beyond that you know, in its representation. So those kind of things are quite crucial. So the hybrid expression is important, but also the kind of ways that you know, we need to think about facades and so on. So the facades here are uh, on the left and right hand side. You know, you'd see that the facades have multiple elements. You know, they are uh, complex composition, you know, they are not necessarily following any of the standard patterns uh, that you would normally find in uh, the Western context. Uh, there are the interface with the street uh, changes quite a lot, you know, the entrance changes in its location and its positioning, also by how it's accessed, but also let's not forget the, the rock or the rewalk, which is kind of where it comes from, the kind of sitting area, which is quintessential to most of uh, sort of uh, the residential architecture of uh, the Hooghly region. But also when, you know, these houses have over a period of time evolved and those rocks uh, have actually evolved in the function too. So you have, you know, the, uh, the structure of, um, you know, possibly the, the Durga Puja, the Durga uh, uh, idol, you know, being kept here, you know, for you reuse later on in the year. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a much more domestic setting on the right hand side. So these things where even a simple uh, use of a particular uh, sitting area is changing because of uh, different types of use and different times of the year. But at the same time, it is evolving because of the changing needs of these domestic settings. Now, uh, again, as part of that, as you'd see in the previous one, that, you know, the relationship with the 
uh, the, 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 the facade and the, the plan form, they are quite diverse and they change from one thing to another. The fact that, you know, on the left hand side on the plan, you know, you've got, you know, the frontal, uh, because of the narrow frontage in this particular case, the entrance is put to the side, but it's not really just that, but its relationship to the courtyard in the middle also changes. So therefore, you know, all of these things then begin to show that there are plan forms, which are not just a standardized plan form, but they kind of, you know, evolve depending on situations, but also they are indicative of what I would say is the kind of morphology of, uh, you know, the, the settlement. And so what I'm trying to suggest is that all of these uh, local, very local factors, local factors that could be uh, very innately local factors, localized factors, like a kind of worship or a particular kind of a perspective on uh, how uh, culture is seen uh, to something which is slightly more generic, you know, maybe per pervading the whole of the Hooghly region or per maybe the whole of Bengal region and also possibly Indian. All of those things are relevant and all of those things begin to interact with different doses of uh, you know, Western architecture, and that's not just French architecture per se, but there is a wide range and a variety of influences coming through, uh, depending on who is taking it and when. So we have this, and unless we actually understand this importance of this, understanding that from the local perspective, I think the outstanding universal values that we would be suggesting would actually be deficient in, in that way. So I'll now move on to the next one. So as I was saying that the courtyard has got many purposes. Some of the courtiers are uh, mainly for creating domestic, uh, undertaking domestic work, and it has evolved and with families, change, with changing financial fortunes and so on, it has become divided, subdivided, you know, it becomes kind of very complex. But uh, essentially, the courtier has been also a way of reorganizing and organizing two worlds. One is uh, the outside world, the front end, and the back end. You know, and uh, so if you look into the range of courtyard organization and its relationship, you know, uh, they vary quite a lot. Sometimes you have got a direct entrance to the to the courtyard and then you have got courtyards. Uh, you have much narrower entrances to the courtyard. So therefore suggesting a much more private world, if you like. But then you have this sort of Thakur Dalan or a, you know, a major worship place, you know, where you would uh, probably have the Duga Puja or other uh, celebrations and so on uh, on a regular basis. Now, these courtiers uh, are, as I say, related to the front, i.e. the street and the front end of the building in different ways. And therefore, they carry different degrees of privacy and uh, publicity, if you like, um, and showing different kind of forms of access and all. So, what I was also going to ask in that previous one is that whether it's possible, therefore, to ask those simple questions of the French and the Indo-French townhouse uh, types, you know, because on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, while they are uh, incredibly, um, you know, slightly different, but they are not incredibly different in terms of the roles and the, you know, the, uh, the work that they, the, the, the functions they perform, but on the other hand, they are not really uh, so easily classifiable as a French and an Indo-French townhouse. So it needs a much more complex uh, understanding of that. And therefore, that's why I was kind of putting up these images where we have the Takut Dalan, which has got different manifestations of it at different locations and relationship to, to the main uh, courtier. So another thing that I would like to say, and I've alluded to just before that, is the morphology. The issue of morphology and the nature of change is quite important for us. So for example, and I'm bringing, coming back to where I come from, very, very close to me, uh, two houses, you know, one where I am and where I live or where I am the next door, both were done uh, into sort of slightly different phases in the 19th century and the early 20th century on the left-hand side, where the, the original house was actually uh, around the courtyard. So it was a courtyard house, a domestic courtyard house with no indication of any kind of uh, Western influence at that time at all. But then in the very uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, the facade uh, was added, which was this front part of it, which was a very Palladian structure. And the next door house was actually uh, cre constructed new at that time, very early 20th century, uh, 1901 to 1911. Uh, that was the construction period where you have uh, sort of a very clearly Palladian sort of uh, um, facade and uh, organization of rooms and buildings with a 
front, uh, narrow front space and our larger back space. Now, what happened was also interesting is that, you know, that in that initial construction there on the right-hand side, what you see is a courtyard was constructed to create a space for the kitchen and the bathrooms, the toilets and the kind of, and the uh, stables and other things uh, as a complete, completely independent one. So if you look into the previous one where the domestic nature of the war, uh, their existence was completely where they grew from and therefore that was central to it. Here, the face of it, what is shown to the public, what is shown to the outsider is being separated from the other everyday domestic activities of the, the house. So there are these kind of things which begin to show how, while the two buildings might look very similar, but morphologically they're very different and therefore they say two different stories and therefore they will actually bring in uh, two different ways of uh, you know, value judgments, if you like, on these buildings. Now, the next thing that I want to go into is the cultural landscape aspect that is, crucial for me because I think we have for so long and archaeological survey of India is probably the main culprit in all of this, but I think all our conservation courses have been doing this uh, over and over again, is to look into buildings as isolated pieces of monuments. And I'm not saying that everyone is doing that, surely not, but nevertheless, this issue of understanding buildings in isolation has created problems, created problems generally for architecture and architectural design, and hence the importance of and those who were in my lecture in the previous lecture, I was talking about the importance of, in the British architectural education system, the importance of urban design work embedded in the five-year architecture project. And so uh, architecture education. Uh, so this, so that there is no div dissociation between the building and its wider context and how we should be understanding it. And this is very important in this particular case of domestic heritage. So for example, that, you know, you have these, uh, buildings, you know, and carts, uh, you know, the structures on the carts, extensive carts have been built, you know, across the Hooghly River, and these are various carts from uh, Chandanagar, having different kinds of roles, some are more public, some are private, some are entirely built through patronage, some are kind of more civic uh, installations, they contain religious focus or not, you know, uh, with it. So the this is uh, an important part of the heritage. But if I were to say that, you know, what, what happened previously was that they would not be taking a bath or a shower, um, you know, at home in the domestic setting, but use the river in many, many cases, or the ponds. And so if you're coming out of your house, you might be actually coming through the lane, the passages, then going down the passage towards the river, possibly paying, uh, doing a prayer at one of the temples, and then going to the ghats, going down the ghats, doing all the rituals with, on, on the ghats, and then coming out drying, you know, your body going through probably another temple and sitting on the rock, you know, to have a, another uh, gossip with somebody else, then you go in for your uh, domestic activities at home. So the domestic space actually expands and contracts depending on the time, depending on the time of the year and depending on what you're doing uh, and the kind of range of things uh, that you would be doing. So it is very important that we understand the spasmodic nature of the domestic space and that's where the cultural landscape becomes critical in the case of domestic architecture. So, you know, you have next to the uh, uh, ghats, you have shrines, tiny shrines. Sometimes there are also shrines devoted to even uh, very minor gods and goddesses and, you know, like, uh, or very important ones, underlying importance, uh, like Mansha and so on. Uh, and then you have also the, these temples then embedded in within buildings, as you can see on the right hand side, where you have a Shiva temple, you know, part as part of the building. And I've already spoken about the Radha Krishna temple, where it's part of uh, someone else's domestic setting. So all of these things become part of the domestic work, and we should not be thinking about just the building per se. And this, as I said, that the this the rock, you know, the the rock, uh, where it comes from, the sort of the lounging space outside because it provided a kind of slightly more comfortable environment to uh, sit down and talk and gossip and get the kind of uh, the gist of what's going on around your world and who is doing what in whose house. All of that comes out in this rock. And that sadly is kind of disappearing for all sorts of reasons. And here, um, Nalin actually, uh, one of the, the sort of local stake stakeholder 
uh, and a great worker and activist, she pointed out this one, which I took a photograph of where this thing has, is now stranded on the left hand side in front of a house which is uh, being newly constructed. Um, but some other cases, they still continue to work uh, feebly though. So cultural landscapes also include, as I was saying, not only the river as it's uh, in the Google map on the right hand side, but also the numerous ponds, you know, the, the ponds, as farther you go in from the river, you know, you will probably have the ponds as the point where people will use it for washing, for uh, bathing, for, you know, all kinds of other activities, and they are integral to it. Sometimes the ponds are part of the, uh, the domestic uh, property, sometimes they are communal properties, and, uh, but essentially this is really a large sponge. You can see Lower Bengal is a large sponge, you know, which uh, used to seep up the water, the excess water into these ponds. Now, gradually, as we are rebuilding things, you know, that is, that is going. And so we need to understand the landscape in that kind of context, rather than looking into particular individual structures and so on. So, uh, but they, this kind of cultural context also impinge on other contexts, uh, like wider political issues and so on. So for example, histor historical political uh, evidences. So Nandadar Mandir, uh, very well known in Chandanagar, um, is, and sadly was, sort of so-called preserved, conserved, you know, way back in the 1950s, as I understand, uh, with a layer of render, you know, but, you know, we forget that it was actually a terracotta um, sort of encrusted temple. I'll, I'll show some examples of that just in the next slide. But the fact that, you know, this was uh, the site of attack, you know, by the Lord Clive when, you know, he was attacking Chandanagar and, you know, the, the, the cannonball hit the back, the rear end of the structure, as you can see on the bottom, is something kind of puts the two worlds of the domestic landscape and this sort of wider international political landscape together. But also we need to note that this Dochala temple, the kind of two folded sort of roof system, you know, does not actually conform to the actual temple inner sanctum is separated into a sing single story structure. So it's again typologically very di slightly different, if you like, from the previous, uh, the other examples. So this cultural landscape then goes, as we grow, you know, we have to think about the wider townscape and how the cultural landscape informs the wider townscape and how what, at what point should we dissociate uh, parts of that and from each other. Okay, so the th next thing I would like to talk about is this sort of role of the community and the heritage management process and the living heritage and innovation. Um, what I would like to emphasize is that in all of this, what I'm trying to say is that, um, uh, sorry, I, I think I'll, I'll just go to the next one just so that I know. Uh, yeah, just uh, this one has been misplaced. So. As I said, the inappropriate management of certain side buildings like the Nandudal Mandir in, on the left hand side, you know, which actually had extensive terracotta decoration as we know from other evidence and also there are little bits of it which are left, you know, that those things have uh, happened to many, many uh, other buildings. The fact that, you know, even today, it was thought that it would be nice to actually uh, put some marble in the front, on the deck, in the front uh, and on the steps is, really a problem, you know, that somebody will have been influencing these things. And unless we actually go into that level to influence the, them back, it is not going to actually uh, work in terms of, uh, you know, our conservation. But what I was trying to say is that the domestic architecture, the very important thing about the Bengal situation is that, you know, collective ownership, you know, multiple ownership of many buildings make it impossible almost to, uh, identify one single owner, which is a dominant way of actually dealing with heritage and conservation of sites. Um, and one of the things that we think that has worked in our case in Oman, certainly, where there is no dearth of multiple ownership, given the Islamic uh, sort of structures of uh, fragmentation of uh, land and property and uh, so on, that it is important that we understand it as a collective measure, that it is seen to be a cooperative, it is seen to be sharing profits rather than uh, having a sole access to a profit. And that way we can actually maintain a lot more structures than we are currently able to maintain because many of the structures are going down even as I speak. So 
our approach to um, you know this whole uh, uh, management of heritage is that you know we look into the past, we are in the present, but we are actually dealing with the future. So the past actually tells us a lot about its previous environment, its society and economics, but that also gives us an opportunity to understand it dynamically across time to the present and in possibly project into the future. And uh, also in the case of the Middle East in Oman, we have looked into the kind of present problems like oil crisis to crisis with uh, you know, uh, expatriate labor to all the kind of things that you know, would be coming into it. And then we are proposing, as I say on a larger scale on a scale up on the cultural landscape, master plans uh, and uh, looking into cooperatives and we are looking into costs and revenues, which is what I'm going to talk through for the next remaining little time. In this, hi. Uh, in this context, I would like to say that I think one of the things that I would like to avoid in all of this case, and hence the case of uh, heritage uh, uh, um, adaptive reuse is this particular example of, from again from Chandanagar about inappropriate conservation, you know, because, you know, rebuilding, especially in a different material, in this case concrete, which, you know, people will absolutely be fine with it. It looks exactly the same. Look, we have got it back, how do we? Uh, but in, in a way it's a travesty. And I think, which is something that we need to avoid. And this comes out of the lack of understanding of, you know, in many of these things. Um, and hence some examples, very quick, wants not to profess anything, but the use of, you know, the combination of old and new, uh, well-established in, you know, uh, conservation spheres and uh, uh, heritage management spheres that, you know, would actually talk about the different types of intervention. That's exactly what we see in the morphology, in the different interventions and buildings that we've seen. So I'll talk about this one, uh, which is a uh, Misfat Alabreen is a little, small little village up in the hills in central Oman. Uh, and I'm not going through all the details of what Oman is and where it is because it will take a lot of time. But we, uh, as part of this, this was part of uh, Ministry of Tourism. Uh, uh, and now it's part of Ministry of Cult Heritage and Tourism. Uh, but Ministry of Tourism uh, commissioned us to do, uh, first of all, a documentation and a study analysis and then a proposal for how to actually manage heritage within this sort of heritage historic context. And it is, it's got an ancient history. The tower that you see over here is actually a, a pre-Islamic Sassanian tower, um, you know, it's known as Kalat uh, The settlement is down on a very complex site, which is down a hill. And there is this wadis, these are actually dry rivers which uh, come through Oman. They, crisscross Oman, uh, they bring down all the water during rain, heavy rainfall, and sometimes it can be incredibly heavy, heavy rainfall. You would actually have these fantastic torrents of water going down these dry rivers, which are called wadis, and uh, they can cause quite a lot of damage, you know, and, you know, deaths and so on. But uh, the settlements are sort of therefore utilizing the edge of these water sources, and they are also utilizing uh, in Oman this uh, ancient uh, water system, which dates back to about 1000 BC, uh, possibly of uh, um, sort of uh, indigenous origin, but with some later Persian technical input into the around six, 600 BC, um, which uh, is called the Falaj system. It's an underground water system which taps into existing aquifers of water and then brings out the water sometimes traveling about you know, eight or 10 kilometers underground before surfacing as the ground slopes down. So it is, uh, there are different types of water systems. One is uh, the water, you know, if the aquifer is hidden below, it's, the, it's called the Dawoodi Falaj, King David, the uh, Suleiman bin Dawood, you know, is an ancient, basically going back to an ancient origin. Spring-based ones, which, are, which is where this one is. So there is a water already coming out uh, on surface and then they have utilized that. And the third one is taking it from the wadi bed where there are perennial flow in the wadi and then they use it. So this is a kind of landscape uh, on the left hand side. It's kind of just a drone view of what it looks like. Aerial photograph um, of the settlement, the old part of the settlement over here, little later down here. These settlements would be probably, as I say, uh, no settlement like this would have not existed in the pre-Islamic time, almost, uh, but maybe in a different, clearly in a different form. Uh, 
So we had this difficult task of undertaking a full documentation, which we had to do. Drones did not work here because we would not be able to, with the foliage, the canopy cover, we could not take a full, um, you know, the, uh, photographic uh, record of that. But uh, we had to do, therefore, result to ter terrestrial uh, documentation. And we did an incredibly detailed documentation, as you could see on the right hand side, uh, which is part of the drawing. Uh, but that forms a part of our, our proposal. We also did extensive ethnographic work, uh, as I said, on the Falage uh, system. So we looked into the Falage system. We understood how the Falage systems worked and how who uh, the administration system of that, uh, what are the kind of uh, divisions of the water, who owned what and so on, but also the land ownership. You know, as you can see on the left hand side, and these things began to kind of form a kind of fuller picture of what uh, we think is uh, it was important in this case. But also, there uh, the other thing that we want to develop successfully in this case is a cooperative. You know, there was a company that already existed, and we, as mediators between the local community and the ministry. Uh, because the, minute, the Oman government didn't have any regulations about creating an, a cooperative uh, or an NGO of that form. So uh, we actually worked with them to develop a structure. We suggested that, you know, what should be done to it. And we also looked very carefully at uh, the structure of a cooperative and how it might work in the context of Oman and how those things would uh, evolve over time. So. At one point when we started this project, there were five families who were members of this uh, cooperative. Now there are 50 uh, families who are members of this community. So that's a really good uh, progress on that front. And I think that has brought about a lot of the conflict resolution that we were looking at. We obviously worked very closely as we developed the master plan, the management plan and so on, looking at a wider perspective, not just the small little part of uh, this village, but a wider thing. And we presented that work at different points to uh, the local community to get their feedback. And uh, that was really important. But at the same time, we were very keen on looking into this energy and the waste reuse. Uh, sustainable energy reuse was, uh, energy was quite an important part of it. And the agenda was to bring it out of the wider intention is to bring it out of the grid, um, you know, if we can. So that's the kind of uh, proposal that uh, went in and we wanted to look into micro, say energy generation, for example, in the flood systems, in the water channels, one can actually put these smaller turbines, which could actually create micro energy generation and then that could be stored. Uh, these days the battery systems have become a lot better, so we can use that. And as I was saying that we looked into the whole, so that being the village here, we looked into the kind of whole context, the wider context, but also looking into the, some of the problems, we wanted to break down the, the visitor uh, sort of, you know, location arrival facility uh, downhill, where uh, then it will allow the traffic movement to work better. We spent a lot of time working on traffic and kind of working on how, what will work for the local community and not during Eid festivals, there are a huge number like, you know, this week, in, uh, in, uh, in that village, there'll be hundreds of vehicles and it's impossible to control. So those were the kind of things that we were looking at, but we were also looking into uh, very carefully um, assessing, you know, the tourism products, the investments that will go in, the capital investments and the tourism products that we can generate that will actually bring uh, the revenues and looking into amortization over a period of time. So looking into how, you know, and we think that typically about seven or eight years you know, if you're taking in, uh, you know, if you're sort of taking a loan, if you like, on a general level, you know, where uh, that has to be amortized on a soft loan even, you know, it takes around eight years, uh, seven to eight years to be beginning to break even and then to make a profit. So one has to factor in a longer term proposal for uh, making these heritage management projects work uh, in that sense. So. Now, then after that, the downturn in oil prices came and, you know, we were told by the government that, look, we can't do anything. You know, you've got to do your stuff. If you want to take this project forward, you've got to engage with a public-private partnership. So this was effectively the first public-private partnership in Oman. 
uh, that we uh, were uh, in, involved with and in implementing. Uh, it actually in the master plan, we looked into both its contemporary needs as I was describing, but also the historical way that the settlement evolved. The original settlement, uh, the entrance currently is from this end, you know, from here, whereas the original settlement entrance was actually down a donkey track and then coming to a souk or a market at the bottom of the hill and then entering the settlement from this end. So we wanted to kind of look into both, you know, we can't change this of course, but at the same time to recognize how we might actually be able to uh, recognize the front end, if you like, what or what was once the front end was also part of that. And the looking very carefully into tribal structures, looking into the different tribal groups, activities and so on, and the traffic, as I said, you know, we started to develop these, um, the master plan proposition. Also keeping um, the issue of privacy, which is in, in the Islamic context, a very important thing, you know, keeping that intact as well. And we looked uh, across, you know, every, pretty much every piece of, um, you know, space that would need to be uh, looked into. As I said, that as we came into that stage where we were not, uh, uh, the government was not going to help, we actually wanted to say, okay, fine, how do we get, go about? First of all, we tried to identify every governmental or non-governmental help that was existing in Oman and uh, you know, in, the, in the Gulf region, and uh, how much of that can we actually access? So that was one piece of work we did, but also fortuitously, perhaps that we uh, also had uh, the Prince Charles's visit to Oman, which uh, I had the opportunity to accompany him in this particular village. There was a lot of discussion that went beforehand, but we took that opportunity to create the visibility of this place. So the visibility was quite important. You know, unless we say aloud and unless we show, nobody knows. So therefore, it is quite important that that happened. And also, there was a uh, Kuwaiti prince who was there as well, which created a fantastic for especially for these extreme sports. He's one of the proponents of extreme sport, and he was uh, he was there too. So these things then made it possible for uh, the Bank of Muscat, which is one of the major banking uh, institutions there to come out and say, well, we will fund partly with the, our CSR scheme, uh, but it will be only a small amount of uh, money. So we said, okay, fine, we'll do a phase one. We worked out exactly what that phase one could be, looking into the kind of, kind of urgent areas of attention that was needed, but also to look into traffic, which was important. So traffic, the issue of um, you know, uh, the parking, uh, the issue of the, the, pay, the pedestrian passage down the main street, uh, the main street down, uh, which was worn away through centuries of walking down and it was incredibly slippery, uh, but also looking into the gateway structure. Uh, the, the, there was a, a training facility on culinary aspects that we wanted to develop. And I'll uh, talk about these ones in a moment. And then also there is a small cafe and a restaurant. So all of these things were part of the phase one, but we went through many iterations whereby we were costing out in every stage, but also in the process, we were able to uh, influence them to say, okay, fine, we will give you more. So we eventually ended up with another uh, probably 100,000 reals or 200,000 pounds more. Uh, on the overall project, but that was really through this negotiation and so showing what we can do and not do. But at the same time, stakeholder participation went on you know, quite a lot uh, at different levels, age levels, and you can see our group here in, a, in the village here, which we undertook uh, in July 2017 in the extreme heat uh, and humidity. We were undertaking workshops there, which were really, really helpful with children and also younger adults uh, of different ages. And that led to a number of participatory activities. They proposed things. Now, by then, because of the discussion that we've been having with the bank, we already had a structure of what we wanted to do. But at the same time, we wanted to get uh, you know, the input from the local uh, children. And they were incredibly helpful in sort of suggesting, especially for the civic spaces, the open spaces, what could be done to it and how those could be addressed, but also um, some parts of the, uh, the restaurants and you know, other things and how that can be built, where and what kind of qualities should it have. So just quickly through those, uh, and I'll finish with these projects here. Uh, these are the final implementation and the, the, the buildings are operational now. There are new, uh, there are um, franchises who are holding 
sort of uh, the cafe has become very popular in Oman. Uh, there is the gift shop, which is beginning to develop and we are helping them to develop their content and everything else as well. And uh, the training facility as well is being part of the culinary aspect. So in terms of not only just restoring the gateway, we managed to convince the, the bank that we needed to also have the information center next to it, given that we were not going to have the information center down the hill, which was originally proposed. And so the structure you see on the right hand side of the bottom uh, where we were inserting uh, new things. Uh, so there were a, a number of restorations. So this is the element up here at the entrance. And so the gateway, as you can see here, we are uh, passing through the, uh, I'm just going to, yeah. So we are, uh, the gateway is underneath here. This is the first floor plan. The gateway goes, uh, the passage goes underneath here, upper level rooms here, and we had terraces <coughs> and so on. So this is just giving a first floor example where we inserted uh, whatever was inserted new have been retained as much as possible uh, in its uh, sort of bare form in its concrete. We focused a lot on um, one feature, which is a consistent feature across the, the various projects that we did. And that was a staircase. Now in a morphological way, I think we thought that you know, it is important that that central space, which is in a domestic space was quite important um, as a sort of, for a number of reasons, I don't want to go into all details, but that was quite important to almost showcase. And therefore by doing a well-crafted staircase, uh, it actually meant that, you know, we were able to give that extra dimension to that space and the other spaces then kind of orchestrated around it. And uh, so various interventions you can see in the, in the buildings here. The next one was this, uh, the culinary training space, which was uh, originally this space in the front, and I'll, I'll go to the next one, yeah. As you can see in the photograph here, this whole congregation is actually during Eid festivals, like this week uh, you'd have, uh, when they will have this roasting pit, which is a bit of uh, a sort of a dent in the ground, a hole in the ground, a pit where uh, they will put their meat you know, and then they will slow roast it over two days and then they'll bring it out and then they will uh, have the meat. It's incredibly delicious, those who are in, um, you know, who are non-vegetarian. Um, so, but also aside from that, there was a, what do you call a raha or a sort of weed grinding area in that front space, which was a community space uh, anyway in the settlement. So we wanted to sort of celebrate that by going for that, the training space that we, were uh, hoping to develop. So it was both the development of this Haratha Shua, which is the Shua is the Tanur or the, this roasting pit and that space, you know, the space around that as well as the building, which is A10, which is this one here that we wanted to develop here. So uh, this buildings, uh, as you can see, were in a very bad state from where we started uh, working through that and we reconstructed, but also we found out a number of things. So this was the original Raha area. Then we went into the staircase is our piece that you know, we are inserting. And then the training space happens at the back. But we also found that in the collapse here that there was a piece of you know, new uh, rock formation that you know, was not clear previously. We assume it was the same level, it wasn't. So we wanted to keep that. Um, so you see the space, uh, central uh, roasting pit here, the building coming up in construction, then in the inside of the building. That is the kind of the pit, pit place where we retain the, uh, the rock structure and we also constructed things around it. Now this also gives some kind of sense of so some of the, the smaller courtiers that are often left behind in many of the, the buildings, although central Omani buildings do not have courtiers at all. Uh, that's uh, con contrary to what our standard conception of uh, Islamic dwellings are. And the third structure was this cafe, which is uh, farther down, which is here. So we did this one first. The next one was this one, which was the training, culinary training one. And this is the cafe, which is over here, which we uh, found in this location, which had a sort of fantastic view of the, the, the gardens or the, the, the oasis. Uh, down here and then there was a bit of disused agricultural terrace and then the structure which was found here. So we were uh, working with this. Uh, again, what has been restored has been restored and what new is very clearly um, uh, evident. And here we were unashamedly 
modern. And in a way, it is also to do with a couple of things. One is that, you know, the aspiration of a future is quite important for many, many communities. And I think it is, uh, you know, the, the fact that we were building in co using contemporary material in conjunction with old material actually gave credence to the fact that, you know, old spaces could be lived in still and modifications can be undertaken carefully and systematically and sensitively if that would be possible. And therefore, you know, uh, it was also a plea to bring back people into these villages in a bigger way. So here you have the restaurant, you know, which uh, had the original structures, access from here. So all that would look very uh, traditional and then it will open up to the outside where we had the two levels of the structures. And again, um, some images which show how we have been treating that, you know, again, the staircase is very similar, but it opens up. So, you know, we, we can create this sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, passively ventilated environments. Um, in all of this, as I said, that the type was very important. Manipulation of the type was important. So we understood types very carefully because of the lot of work that we've done, the role of the staircase and how it brought in light, but also how it could be enhanced. You know, and that's what we were trying to do with the staircase feature. The environment, of course, air, light, and water were the three things that we were working with. There was plenty of light, of course, without a doubt. Air, there was plenty, and water, when it came down, was torrential. So we had to plan and design with those things. And so mostly these are all uh, passively ventilated with local air conditioning opportunities that we were trying to do. Also, for example, in the water, you know, the drainage of the heavy downfall was something that we worked on quite a lot. For, for example, here in the cafe, this was a kind of feature which took the water down and then down to the gravel bed and down another spout down to the lower level of the agricultural terrace. On the right hand side in this info, information place of the gift house, gift, uh, gift shop, where we actually used the existing openness of the cut, the rock cut, and then we diverted that. It is not fully complete yet and we are still working with them to make that fully happen. But that is that is what we were looking at in this particular diagram here, that, that it is in place, but has to work now. So, and the other one is about the creating that atmosphere of, um, you know, bringing in the outside in uh, is quite an important thing about architecture because that is how the context becomes realized. And in this case, by creating these other elements, inserting an element like a kind of a very simple read um, uh, pergola, actually it throws the shadows and by throwing the shadow, it actually makes the topography come alive. Without the, the, the shadows, the topography is dead. So in that way, we are, our measures are beginning to, I suppose, uh, you know, indicate you know, how we can recover the context and recover the you know, this site. So that's where I'll end and I'll stop sharing if that's okay. Um, so the basic, points that I'm trying to make is that, first of all, we uh, need to think about cultural landscapes. And I think it is also very important that stakeholder engagement becomes a much bigger issue than just uh, lip service to it. Uh, I think it is imp important, especially in the Hubli River region where multiple stakeholders mm. has to be worked on. And there is almost, you know, many doctoral theses to be done, you know, to understand how exactly stakeholder engagement can work and what will work and what will not work in that context. But I still feel that a cooperative approach is very necessary. So the cultural uh, landscape has to be a dynamic one. It has to be an evolving one. We need to actually engage with that one in a creative manner, keeping the research as our base. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Shominda. Um, it, was, uh, it was quite a journey. Um, I, I looked upon it as a completely two distinct presentation uh, of two different contexts, um, but, but there is some linkages, of, of course. Um, I would request Professor um, Rajut Rai um, to, and Pro Professor Bentevul to make some initial comments, because we'd like to have at least a half an hour discussion on, on Hoogli heritage and and, and, and the lessons learned from all the initiative that went into um, the Hoogli Heritage Front. And of course, if we can draw some, uh, some lessons from Oman, which, um, which was presented. So the initial comments from 
um, from Rajat Rai and uh, Ben Tibbles. I would My only request is that the questions and the comments be short and precise and so that we can take in a lot of discussion forward. Yeah, can you please unmute? Thank you. Can everybody unmute, please? Yeah, Rajudda. And, and, and Rajudda, can you just be visible as well? Yeah. And everybody can be visible, actually. It's, it makes a lot more easier. Yeah. Yeah, mute, 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 mute. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Okay, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unmuted. Yes. How much time? How much time you give to? Uh, I speak too much. I'll talk too much. How much? I'll, 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 I'll cut you short. I'll, 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 Does that, I'll, that sound I'll, fair? Tell me two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Two minutes, five minutes. one minute. You know, you're okay. making your initial comments. Okay, yeah. okay. Let it be a half okay. an hour news item. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for calling me. And uh, in the context of Ugly, if you say, it makes sense that I, I enjoy what's happening. But I come from a very personal position uh, because I have, uh, what do you call, worked in this area. I didn't really work. I uh, sort of engaged myself in this area. Uh, so that I can actually talk about it later. I just want to make some initial comments regarding uh, this. Uh, I got a chance here, I don't know what it calls me. What I want to say is, uh, let us just look at this, uh, uh, the huge heritage enterprise and uh, starting with outstanding universal value. I believe most important thing is beauty. Unless something is beautiful, uh, it stands very little chance. Now, if we say Miss World, Miss Universe, and then Miss Earth, and so on, they are beautiful, but uh, every human is also beautiful. Uh, that's the pointer. Then to establish the outstanding universal value, or in any case of heritage uh, contestation, there's a question of observing, understanding, and analyzing it. What I observe now is that the frameworks of analysis, on one hand, they're standardized thanks to this converging competition environment. I don't want to talk about the various political layers it introduces, keep that aside. Now, these various frameworks are very standardized frameworks. Most common framework is history. Uh, beauty is not really a framework in, in, in explicit terms. It's a kind of underlying. Now, if you allow me, in context of history, I have had a very peculiar experience. Uh, please allow me. The Calcutta Municipal Corporation Heritage Committee had set up a five category, five aspect in a framework. And I landed up there and suddenly, and I saw there was uh, historical, social, cultural, and architectural styles and history. They went on ground, the one building was listed heritage. Next to that stood another building, very nice, very beautiful, but not listed heritage. What transpires is the committee has historians. So for them, historic value comes from history itself, right? Very legitimately. And they are, legit, they are very uh, sort of legendary historians. Now I go there as an architect, my mind is architecture and I'm talking about historic value of architecture. History has problems. Number two, architecture itself. When it is analyzed, the, usually the architectural analysis is limited to stylistic analysis. And some people do typology, as Shoman is talking about. So that also is incomplete. Then comes uh, your cultural landscape and social analysis. Now, all these aspects come from various disciplinary directions. And then they're put together and they go into a document report where the documentation itself has another tremendous value. The quality of documentation in the presentation has another value. So you come from a place and you reorganize it into various sort of, uh, let's say structuralist <laughs> way, various factors and identify uh, all those factors and then put it together in a convergent whole, but you cannot really converge. So under that circumstances, I have some personal cynicism I have developed 
and uh, as opposed to and then i look back on hugli what i did i am finally able to get to the problem and um, if you want me to speak later i'll talk about it i want yeah, this is an initial yeah. comment yeah you should you should divide I'll your relate, comments i'll relate it to his hugli also yeah yeah please make an initial comment so that there's others who can participate um and and that yeah, will yeah, be nice Uh, ben Jay. The most important comment I made, and if you want to anything on Hugli, if you have time, I'll make my personal yeah. experience. Can you just can you just summarize? Uh, um, can you just? I think you mentioned about the uh, the outstanding universal value and how that uh, is kind of. What, what I let me summarize. Let me summarize. I look at this heritage uh, uh, thing that is happening. It's a huge, big enterprise. It's a very yes. large enterprise, uh, and uh, it is very uh, kind of it has its own rules and formulations, and various of its you know layers, which somehow right. for me it is I'm not preaching anything. For me, it defeats right. the 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 thing in in, in a certain way. Yeah. I can so detail it out if you have it later on. That, that that's my problem with heritage. And it's going on and on and on. Huge enterprise. Rajat has a problem of um, a structured. way of looking at heritage yeah then take yes can you hear me yes good yeah i'm not an architect i'm not a historian i'm an anthropologist so i, I see it very much the whole thing from the uh, people perspective but um taking the term of beauty mentioned by uh, professor roy I mean, looking at architects' work, it's always so beautiful. And when it's in Oman and far away, it's even more beautiful because it also looks so simple. You have this beautiful place, and you can turn it into something even more beautiful. And people have this old inherited water system, and they collaborate and they make a cooperative. But then transposing that to Hugli. is more messy or is more difficult uh because yes i agree we have outstanding universal value in hookley definitely because where else in the world do you find a place with these kinds of architecture and telling that particular story about history uh of uh, europe and india trading together Europeans coming to a place which was already a world trading center that's why they came here you don't have that kind of place anywhere in the world in west africa you have the slave trading fortresses european but you don't have that local architecture together with the european architecture and all those middle forms but as you rightly said uh, dr shoman it's uh, it's disjointed it's disjointed and how do we uh, presented or how is it to be be presented we all know that it's a connected area but it's difficult to present and even more difficult is the fact that it's not just people changing and modifying their individual heritage buildings but we all know the elephant in the room here is that these uh, these towns are um, are all uh, suburbs to kolkata they are part of kolkata metropolitan area we have huge big uh, residential blocks coming up we have huge, huge big government blocks coming up um so it's 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 a very uh, it's a very different uh, setting um and and the way i tend to see it more and more is that it's a matter of urban development rather than than simply um uh, preserving heritage is urban development and not necessarily related to tourism or at least tourism may not be the main driver but urban development be the main driver and to go back to the term of beauty i think what we did in serampore was that we we could realize that the planning process making this beautiful plan and then implementing it would not work because we were up against these uh, concrete blocks coming up all the time so what we did was we started restoring and by actually recreating as you said professor roy some of that beauty 
it became inspiring even for local citizens, even for local uh, politicians and for bureaucrats uh, covered by being visible. You mentioned visibility, uh, Dr. Schumann, yeah? Here, visibility was created through the local press. The Telegraph, the Hindu, Hindustan Times, so on and so forth. And after the buildings were restored, visibility was created by ordinary people on social media, uh, spreading that vision for the area. So by, by uh, somehow recreating some beauty in the local urban landscape, some of these high-rise buildings were not built. They were shifted. Their locations were shifted. Like a motor vehicle office was shifted to another position before it was even built. Other concrete buildings were, were demolished by the, by the district magistrate. So, so instead of starting with the plan, because so many tourism plans have been made for Hooghly, yeah? and so many plans, so rather we try to recreate some of the historic um, beauty of the area, and then the government and citizens, they jumped on the, on the train and, and, and uh, we achieved what we could. It's not, it's not, it doesn't look as beautiful and as coherent as, as what you just presented, Dr. Shoman, from Oman, because Sirampur is, an, is a modern town, it's a modern city, it's part of a, a, a metropolitan city. Um, but still, yeah, um, I think I made my point. It's difficult to compare, but we can still compare. Yeah, I think, I think you know, Bente and Rajudda, uh, I think Bente, uh, if, I, if, I am, if, I'm, if I'm correct, um, where, uh, is, is more, more concerned not on the outstanding universal value per se, uh, but it, it perhaps will grow over a period of time. But it is very important that how the conservation or conservation of a place like uh, or different places in Hooghly um, needs to be perhaps a preferred form of development. Uh, and, 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 and I think uh, that because that is really taking away, the current form of development is really taking away the, uh, the cultural value, which we still feel has an outstanding universal value, uh, but it's 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 an erosion, it's in a constant erosion, and and, and that erosion um, uh, perhaps uh, will remain unabated uh, if 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 initiatives in the field of conservation are viewed not as a purest sense of the term. That's why I like the presentation talk talking about beyond restoration. I wonder um, uh, whether. Oman's examples will be really uh, considered restoration by the UK standards of conservation. Um, uh, and I, do, I, do, I, do, I, I would like to hear your comments on that. Um, uh, as, as UK sees conservation in a, in a rather museum, uh, not at all beyond conservation uh, when it comes to restoring a building. Um, uh, and and, and uh, 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 so I, I, I would prefer um, that how, I, I would take that Benty mentioned that how conservation can be uh, uh, looked upon as a preferred form of development. It's a modern town. Uh, most of the towns in Hooghly are modern town. And, and therefore, how we can, we can sail the boat together um, for, for mutual benefits. Because uh, examples of adaptive reuse uh, and, and many other can catch the attention of the drivers of development. Um, and, and I think that is a very important, crucial part uh, of, of, of taking uh, on board and in the process to teach what is a good restoration and so on and so forth. Um, I, I, I fully agree uh, with Rajudda, um, uh, but there are others who can come in. Rajudda mentioned about big enterprise. Well, um, uh, in, in, in Hooghly, uh, there are big enterprise really coming in. Um, the other side of the river, there are huge development which are taking place. Um, um, but uh, development per se is not, um, not uh, um, anti-place. Anti, uh, uh, development is always welcome, but 
um, how we make connections, how we learn, and how we how we coexist uh, uh, is 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 I think is is a very important challenge in the context of third world or a developing situation like ours, or be it in Penang or any other places um, where 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 uh, it is very important that how we kind of uh, uh, coexist and and then take the agenda uh, which are mutually inclusive i would say um, for the betterment of uh, the place and the people um, uh, is is a big challenge which i think um, is, is to be is to be is to be harnessed in its full potential now or never yeah i i would like to perhaps uh, see uh, people from other uh, participants i could see shongomitra basu my teacher um, uh, in 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 uh, in iit kharagpur my masters and i could see sonia gupta i could see pooja and many others who would who would like to uh, see this presentation and and make their comments as well rajuta You give me a second chance, or you meant Shominda when you called yeah. my name? Yeah, yeah. Please, Shominda will hear us, and then yes, in. yeah, he said a lot. Now, <laughs> so I, 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 I think it will at some point if I can get a chance to respond to <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. what is being said. Well, 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 yeah, well, sure. well. <laughs> well uh, my cynicism and my no, no, no. It's not that I disagree with you, Rajita, <laughs> but it's simply that I think it is. Uh, you know, there is a point to be made about. Bringing everyone together, exactly what I was saying at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I'll talk about that later. Uh, can I request you to allow me to share a screen just for two pictures, if it is possible? Yeah. Administratively possible. Otherwise, I can go on. Yes. Uh, uh, Oyendra, can Roger? Yes. Yes. Just give me a second. Just give me a yeah. second. I think uh, I think Professor Roy will be able to share. I can. Okay. Yes. There's a window option or whole whole screen option there, here. There's a sh uh, uh, sure. There's a window option. Yes. Whatever picture you want. Yes. To yeah, share. yeah, 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 yeah. I got it. I got it. Junior. Are you visible? Is it visible? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Should come. So, Arriving. I'm sorry for this. Uh, yeah, there are some technical snags. Man. Technical, yeah. yeah. Can you can you can you can you stop my sharing for a while? Then it'll be all right. Just stop it. Okay. Okay, let me let me just uh, talk yeah, about it. I, I'll try try one second. What I was wanting to share is the cover page of our report uh, on Hoogly, which has a sketch of Saint Olaf's and uh, a hand drawn sketch. Anjan was with me, and that was 1988. This outline sketch as it existed there, very very simple sketch, uh, and another uh, two pictures. At that time, uh, there was a small shop, a kiosk, in front of the church uh, down the line. I mean, before you reach the gate, a cigarette shop. And there was one uh, gentleman, the owner of the shop. He would be 25, 30, 30 years old at that time. So since two souls were going around there with camera and just looking around, he showed, uh, he called us and see, just see, they would. He took out two models made with cigarette packet paper of the church. One was a red model with that brand, and other was a golden model. So you see, I've done this. And he was wearing a lungi and a t-shirt. Uh, just that's the picture I remember. I, we took and then the report also. And uh, first time I went to this place was in 1973 or four, three, 
uh, for, I think, uh, no, 70, something like that. Well, when the, I'm from Calcutta, so I'm an outsider, but I'm not as outsider as an UNESCO representative. And I had a special chip on the shoulder because I'm Calcutta, the big brother heritage. And these are the smaller heritages. So we had the chip on the shoulder. But that time, I didn't know anything of this. I had an Alpha Click 3 camera with which I shot pictures of Bandel Church window silhouette and St. Olaf's Church and a few other things. And I felt the place, which was different from Calcutta. What I mean to say is, uh, among all these frameworks, which lead on to intervention through those gateways, uh, in terms of historical significance, in terms of architectural significance, in terms of very detailed architectural significance, what it, for very personal, for me, I would feel uh, very hesitant to go back to Sri Rampur because it is not exactly nostalgia. It is the value of the firsthand experience, phenomenological matter, which is not interfere, uh, which is, I mean, history has no place there. Uh, you know, any, any uh, sort of complex dimensions of cultural knowledge has no place there. But what I see, each component is part of all these disciplinary analysis in any case. But that experience is possibly the unique experience, which has a value for me, which is still different from the local in a resident. They have another one. Now, there are multiple local residents, as uh, Bente's little article so, so crisply brings out. That experience is of a very typical value, which is, I think, of, uh, of utmost importance. And uh, it varies. When I go there, I go to Calcutta, somebody goes from Banaras, somebody goes from, they're from New York. They're all there have their own experience. I'm a tourist, they're a tourist. I have gone to Chandra, Showman's house in Chandranagar in a different perspective. I've gone to a place, gone to his place, gone to the Strand, came back. I, at some point of time, after that in 88, I was still trying to understand what is the difference between Dutch uh, colonial uh, Thakurbari and French colonial Thakurbari and Danish colonial Thakurbari. They're all classical Thakurbari. So this splitting, I, I went through it. We studied morphology of these towns, trying to prove what is the Dutch morphology, Chandanagar information, is Chandanagar morphology. I got into this big rut. I have done conservation projects, then I realized hard work, you know, what uh, uh, Manish does. All these things somehow uh, is, uh, for me, it's a, it's, it's a, I won't say problem because I cannot challenge the good work that is done everywhere, but it misses my point. That, 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 that phenomenological framework, if you want to say academically, that experience is something of very uh, high value. And that includes everything, the Bihari labor to the Panwala to the building. And they know that or whatever shape, that's all. That's yeah. of utmost importance. Yeah. Yeah. How, sure. how, the, how the interventions are going to affect that is, a, uh, for me, a very dreadful thing to imagine. They will be very high quality in themselves. And they have their own, uh, own theoretical issues to restore or to conserve or to shine it. Or Martin's Pagoda, should it be? You know, I don't know what is done to that. All, all the tree should be taken out. Yes, there are practicalities and some kind of sensible issues. However, that experience is the, the primary thing for me. I'm sure can I this. Say something? Yeah, can I make? Uh, yeah, yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, no, Rajada, uh, what I, I don't think that there is any. And precisely when you said beauty, I thought that is it beauty or is it because beauty is to do with eye? And, uh, you know, you're not talking beauty, you're talking about the phenomenological aspect, which is yeah. the atmosphere. Atmosphere. Better on. Think, but they, you are so, the system suffers from beauty. That's my complaint. No, no, no. My problem is that I don't think that there, that exists anymore as such, you know, in yes. all the spheres. And we need to get the right friends, you know, to, to get the right people together. So, for example, that there are historians and then there are historians. So, there are historians who are very much schooled in the structuralist way. Then there are post structuralists who are taking different takes on it. Uh, there are also these many, many stories which are actually be becoming part of many heritage studies in many parts of the world. Now, my problem in India is that we have, A, that we have comp compartmentalized education system, and B, that we have many massive egos, right? 
we do not work together. So for example, if you say that, and I absolutely agree with Bente that it is not, it is not a tourism related problem. It is neither a heritage related problem. It is about human development. It's about uh, urban development. It is about settlement development, I would say, you know, and that includes all these kind of things. But my problem there is that, you know, whenever you speak to a planner, because if we say planner, or they will say, no, 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 this is our area. You can't actually come into it. No, we can come into it because we are also human beings. We have, as you say, Rajatha rightly, that I have an experience of, you know, that, you know, making that uh, model, you know, that Pan Biriola was going to give you. So the, unless we have this interdisciplinary work and we are genuinely accepting interdisciplinary work, knowledge will not develop. And unless there is no, there's knowledge, I think we will be working on purely instrumental approaches. And that's what we have been doing. And we are doing in many cases, I'm not saying everyone at all, no. But we have to create a situation whereby this phenomenological content that you're talking about can be discussed. This is part of the discussion. It, and it can find, it, it will not find its way into a physical representation in a, in a restoration, perhaps but it might actually be a recording which will be lodged in the, that building, you know, or it might actually be, become part of a film. It can be all kinds of things, you know, that's all fine, but we have right. to accept that this right. is this landscape. And that yeah. packaging is also a point of contention. For, for Rajabda's information, I remember, perhaps it's the same stall, perhaps it's the same stall, Rajabda, uh, that, that particular man, we wanted to, put some grill so that the church premises is more visible because that part of the end, he used to sit in the that tea stall, pan stall, used to sit on the left hand side of the church. Now, <laughs> Still now, there. <laughs> now, now, now he has just gone diagonally opposite because we wanted to do, uh, we wanted to do the grill. So the grill has been installed. He has shifted himself from in front of the church to the left to diagonally opposite, but he exists there. And, 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 uh, but that shift might put you into a nostalgia trip, uh, but, but that, that, is, uh, that is something which, uh, which, which, that is also a change, change of place. Uh, he has been diagonally shifted. But I think when we are talking about a town in terms of its scale and size, I think I think that particular shift, or 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 or, or relocation, um, is is acceptable uh, for the for the for the uh, for the for the context. But we should be particular that such uh, so-called beautiful development in the name of conservation often lands up into huge large-scale dis, uh, disposition. And, 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 and I think that is, that is, of course, not to be encouraged and, and try to be minimized. But, you know, we are, here, we are, here we are trying to tackle an area where there was no concern about old structures. There has been uh, incessant uh, destruction uh, about, about, about old buildings and places. Along with it, all the memories that you talk about is also erased. So the onus of conservation movement, if I may say, which is gaining such an importance in, in the context of India is this, that it has to be uh, protected. And I see personally, one of the way of protecting this conservation is to, to uh, get into a deal with development, to get into a deal with development uh, as well and to deal with the deal of the planning process. It is not utopian, it is possible. And I think we need a lot more demonstration uh, of the fact that it is possible to demonstrate. Um, because I don't see a future where, uh, where everything is hunky-dory and, and we does a very flexible dossier and these things are protected on its own. Um, and I think that is where the real pinch lies. And, and I think that is something which cannot be ignored. Yes. Manish, 
you asked me uh, about this uh, outstanding universal value if i if i didn't find it important uh, i find it i mean i think hookly fits that term more than any other place i know in terms of uh, of world heritage because as i said i don't think there is another place in the world of that kind absolutely the, uh, absolutely <laughs> it's it's it is outstanding it's not even it's not even a tactical thing to yeah. say it is of an outstanding universal value and it's unique which is also what world heritage uh, should be because there are so many other kinds that that are repeating themselves of type but this there is not a place like this as far as i know Ooh. Ooh, uh, but then... it is disjointed but the problem yes. i think uh, because we've talked about beauty and cynicism yeah and and I'm also inclined to be cynical, and that's I think has been our starting point very much in Serampo to start from being cynical, and then see what you can do from there, rather than having any some kind of a utopian idea of what it can be. So start with cynicism. On the other hand, if you I also as you did, uh, uh, Showman read Lynn Meskel, and that's when you become so cynical that you think it you know. Hookly doesn't have this, doesn't stand a chance in terms of UNESCO World Heritage because that kind of lobbying and networking and whatnot, what she describes, is I can't see who would do it. So yeah. I find Hookly the perfect candidate, but I can't see who is the advocate. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and who will do it? So, so she takes uh, cynicism to a new dimension. Yes. But I am not concerned whether it's designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site or not. But what is more concerning is that this unique uh, site of cultural landscape of so many communities uh, living together and yet having a distinct uh, uh, beauty, quote unquote, which uh, the atmosphere which Shominda said um, uh, is, 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 is protected while, while and, and living. And I think that is a very important uh, aspect of, um, and I think Gwyn has a, can, can comment very much because Gwyn has been kind of striving uh, with this from Penang. Gwyn. Gwyn, so nice to see you again. You're unmute, unmute. Yeah. They just let me unmute. Great. Um, yeah, Penang has, I, I'm not that um, convinced by UNESCO listing, though um, I would say that the OUV is a very interesting guideline um, worth actually getting back to every now and again to set your mind in the right direction. Um, I, I love what Bentley says about Serampore being, it's an urban development of which there is a very interesting heart uh, with a great history. And I totally agree with you, but you have to set the pace, you have to start, you have to create the bandwagon because no beautiful plan is ever going to get off the ground. But if you quietly get on with something, then it can actually inspire because a lot of people can't read plans. A lot of the people in high places have no idea what your gorgeous drawings really actually mean. But if you can see it and walk around it, touch it and almost taste it, then that really gets people enthusiastic about what you do. Um, and I just love the, I have seen the project in Oman before. I think it's through a Prince Charles um, organization. It's absolutely beautiful. I just love the way that the light plays and the materials and, and how the modern and the old work together. And I think if you put that in a bigger context of somewhere like Serampore, and don't worry about UNESCO listing, that's for the politicians to think about. You just keep going, using UNESCO as quite a good guideline, but don't get hung up over it. And, it, and get on with some good urban development. <laughs> That's my yeah. bit. Yeah. Chongumitradi, Chongumitradi, are you there? <laughs> Before. Chongumitradi, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Yeah, we'd love to have your. Um, some comments on on the whole discussion uh, it has been very interesting so i i do agree that it is more a question of yeah 
maybe World Heritage and other things, but I'm more concerned about the development, which uh, has been recently mentioned, because right. uh, oh. when I visited uh, Sri Rampur with my students, I think yes, the Danish Traven and other, a very good example as a pilot project and uh, to show that what can be done. But I was also very, mm, it was a very, painful to see that uh, it's not only the public spaces or those few buildings is a is a mm, different types of heritage, vernacular, shared heritage and others, which are all private properties. And these private properties, people are demolishing that. Sometimes they are being demolished to give the flats. And what is uh, sad to see that they are creating some elements uh, which are a copy or so-called copy of the colonial architecture and some of the buildings are there because of the uh, these uh, family multi joint ownership and other they had to extend and uh, suddenly uh, on a beautiful uh, gate beside that uh, ugly toilet block has come up uh, because of the lack of awareness to guidance that even that can be done, uh, which can be done properly. I'm not using the word aesthetics, but properly uh, modern intervention, which has been shown by showmen also very good example that and and some only one or two examples are there where billing people have kept, but they are not uh, don't know what to do with that. So uh, I think it is much more a question of uh, the development of these different categories of the buildings, private ownerships and other, even how to guide that, how the new buildings will come up, which will be modern, but in uh, in harmony. So I, I think it's the municipality, the urban development, uh, the local planning, what I uh, we are trying to look at, the local planning and the people awareness, they are very important if you really want to talk about this, all these settlements, which had, uh, it's the buildings are only representative, the morphology, the everything is a part of that. And not only European, there were other earlier heritage of that, where there are a lot of NGOs are working. So I think uh, there is a heritage led development or whatever terminology you give that. I think ultimately we have to bring it to the local area development, which uh, to guide that uh, along with the municipality, how that should be done. Uh, where the people themselves know that yes, they're leaving uh, places, but yes. uh, what are the guidelines? And yes. that's why the grading are very important as mm -hmm. Roger said, but that, that, that matrix to develop that even those many, many structures what can be done with them? What grading are there? Some can be adaptive use, some can be uh, uh, addition, alteration, and other. Your Danish yeah. turban is a beautiful example to start with, even the charges and other. But I think we have a lot of work to develop, uh, work with the local right. development and also right. the economics from right. where the money will come. And that's right. all I have to say. Uh, Shominda, does your management plan for Hooghly, which you're working on along with such a long list of people, uh, will try to address some of these issues? Yeah, I think that is, uh, that is the intention that we certainly do not see it. And all the things that, you know, has been discussed, whether it's by Rajata or uh, Bente and uh, others, and, you know, uh, Gwen as well, great to see uh, everyone. But uh, it's, it's just that, yes, uh, we are following that inclusive <laughs> Um, approach to it. And I think it is uh, also important that we are suggesting, which we have, you know, hopefully when the final piece comes out, we'll be able to demonstrate that it is uh, more closely integrated with planning right. um, than with, and planning, I do not want to use the word planning, neither do I want to use architecture in all of these kind of contexts, because these are not separate territories and we've made ourselves into these little boxes, you know, which are really, really problematic. Um, right. And so I think, but essentially what we are saying is that yes, it needs to be tackled at the larger scale before we come down to the smaller scale as well. So you'd have, you know, sort of various scales to work with. Um, yeah. But at the same time, we will, uh, you know, work with landscape planners, we will work with the urban designers and so on and so forth. But crucially economics, at the end of the day, as uh, Bente was indicating that I think if we cannot, make this a living place, it will be a dead yes, place. Absolutely. You know, people will, 
and then very soon it will be replaced by all the other blocks. And hence my plea that, of course, we cannot probably save everything if we will not be. But on the other hand, if there is a carefully understood sympathetic uh, planning regime in place, and that is also schools of architecture, schools of planning, we have a big role to play and we have often not taken that role up. You know, and I'm not saying everyone again, but you know, it has been only uh, uh, applied intermittently. Um, therefore, I think our education is limited in terms of how we should be tackling if it comes to a heritage site. What do we do? Yeah. You know, I don't think that we're equipping architects to do that. So uh, the issue, as you pointed out, is that also at the smaller scale, when it comes to a house, if we can show that there could be other ways of dealing with the house, which can become attractive in many ways and economically viable, then there is a future to these buildings as well as the bigger plan to exist. Yeah, and I also liked uh, how the public, uh, it was a PPP model of financing such projects, which was also, I think, uh, is, 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 a, is, the old, is perhaps a better alternative because um, the government by and large has been increasingly not spending on um, projects which are not determined to give returns and uh, 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 all over the world, I would say. And, uh, uh, and, and therefore, perhaps this kind of model of financing such projects, which are otherwise doesn't happen, um, uh, will, will, will perhaps be a way forward, isn't it? Can I say that I think it will bring benefits? It will yes. bring re re returns. If only we look at it, first of all, as I was indicating, that I think we have to give it time for it to become economically viable. But the economics is one part of the benefit that it will bring in. You know, what about right. the other benefits of social benefits, of health, well-being benefits, you know, the benefits of education, loads of right. other things that, you know, uh, and, you know, of course, uh, the beauty uh, within inverted commas, I would say, right. the experience of the space. I think those right. are all benefits that have to be added to, together to right. and present it as a value judgment, as a value proposition. Because otherwise, you know, if we say to the government that yeah, it's only going to give you 200 rupees, then you know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I request everybody to put their video on? And before, I think we are already at eight o'clock and we have been discussing this for quite some time now. And uh, so that we can have a group photo together. Uh, that would be great. Um, and, uh, uh, and also, can I ask Oen uh, uh who is from a background of English, um, who is anchoring our show in a way, um, if you have any questions with regard to this discussion, uh, that will be great before you kind of uh, close uh, today's session. When do you uh, Yes, I. Uh, 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 oh, I uh, uh, there are lots of congratulatory messages, actually. Uh, there's, there's one text. In fact, it's uh, uh, you've mentioned her name, Miss Sonia Gupta. I'll just yes. read that out. Uh, congratulating on Professor Bhattopadhyay's work. Uh, uh, two points to draw attention to, she says. Community participation is vital, but how far it is, is it applicable for the Hooghly River of Cultures project, given the heterogeneity of immediate stakeholders as compared to this fact? Right. That's it. Right. Yeah. No, I was more, because everybody can see that, and I was more interested to hear if you have a question emanating from this discussion. That would be great to hear. Uh, I'm just enamored by the, you wanted to uh, ask my opinion, right? I'm just yes. enamored by the whole discussion. So much, yes. uh, you know, uh, brainstorming, pouring in. And I, I, would, I was just thinking if this was a physical session, we're missing out on that. This is what I constantly kept on thinking if this uh, with uh, Gwen Jenkins uh, her ideas and uh, Dr. Wolf and right. uh, Professor Bandupalta and uh, uh, 
Madam uh, Shanko Mitra Basu and Professor Roy, everybody, it's just so lively. I, I would just, I just uh, think uh, that uh, uh, not just for uh, people uh, studying architecture at uh, Sister Nivedita University, uh, this session is something that every student of architecture should listen to because it, it has so much of value addition. All of you, so much of value. Right. If you've worked in the field, that's what that's what I take away. I'm not a, I'm right. not a, and I'm not an architect. I know nothing of it. But there was so much to take away from. And what uh, Dr. Wolf said, uh, the human development uh, index, not not the beautification, nothing regarding the. Uh, it was so right. it was yeah. heartfelt, and uh, I think mm. uh, that that is what uh, it, this thing will right. uh, etched in my memory. What a wonderful discussion! And thanks and all I of you for some great more participation. Anybody has any other question before we wind up uh, with last words from Rajadda? Anybody uh, having any other question? Uh, I could see Claudia, I could see uh, Yamilia, Cecilia, Shundatta from Shobon, and uh, Shudipto, Paul. Anybody else would like to put in a comment before we close down? Paul, oh, nice to see you after a long time. <laughs> How is this? Paul has worked in Ms. Fatala Preen, you know, doing all the hard documentation work with various others. I think, uh, uh, yeah. you know, the Claudia, Claudia and Jamila, obviously Jamila and Claudia are both, uh, you know, working, you know, we are very closely working on everything in Ms. Fat. Uh, Paul uh, is uh, hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Paul uh, yes, Paul has, spent, brother. Paul has spent. Paul has spent. is my brother. Yes, absolutely. And Kulani, I could see Hello, a Vashu. conversation architect. Yeah. Um, my colleague. Shudipta da. Hello. 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 Can you Shudip put our is, video on? Shudipta you know? is the same classmate as Rajat. Rajat classmate. Great. Great. Uh, so, so officially, Oenrila, over to you to say the session closed. Uh, I will just take a picture in my mobile. That's uh, yeah. That's... Smile. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. So, thank you that's to what everybody. Japanese do, isn't it? That's what the Japanese do. With a monument behind you, click a photograph and onto your bus. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank I you so much. Add, I should just add that it's for me, it's very special to be back in Kolkata after, after one and a half years of COVID. And Kolkata, <laughs> I can tell you, the people who are not here, that it's, it's a quiet version of itself. And I have to be back, Monish, before uh, 50 minutes because there's a curfew on. So uh, just to let you know that Kolkata is not, it, it is its good self by a good old self, but it's also different, but still it's great to be here. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, Rojita. Thank you, Shominda, and all the participants. Uh, thank you very much. Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. everybody. Uh, I, I I hope to continue this discussion back at our campus someday after yes. everything normalizes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Professor Chakrabarti, for organizing this session. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to every participant. What a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I am unable to go to, uh, to, a, to, a, uh, to a place to cut my hair. It's growing. Wow. You look beautiful. But our session today is available on YouTube in the Sister Nivedita University channel. Kindly please um, subscribe to the channel. You get it's to also see the same videos. Thanks. It's also it's on also in our Industry Connect page Thanks. and up here at social. Well, Indra, could you kindly send us the links, please? I will. I will. <laughs>